Okay, so we uh, we looked at uh, some uh, ocean uh, observations already in uh, I think chapter two. We're going to add some more information in the context of the ocean circulation that we just learned about in terms of deep water formation, uh, thermohaline circulation, subtropical gyres, and so on. So this is a nice figure which uh, gives you a sense. Uh, this is the temperature uh, trend over the top uh, 700 meters from 1971 to 2010. Oftentimes, these time scales over which trends are computed tend to differ from, uh, let's say, SSTs to heat content in the top 700 meters, heat content below 2,000 meters or 700 to 2,000 meters, and so on, because the uh, continuous data that we have for different things are different uh, time periods. Ocean temperatures have a much more complete record going almost back to the 1800. Uh, 60 or so, 1860s, uh, but deep ocean temperatures we have only for more recent times and so on. And we always have to keep in mind that when we take such a short period of 1971 to 2010, uh, it's not always uh, guaranteed that multi-decadal variability, uh, which could be natural variability, uh, is not being confounded with trends, but uh, uh, keeping all that in mind, we look for consistencies or multiple evidences, so it's detective work where you look at not just one thing but multiple things and try to put together a story of anthropogenic impacts and trends in various uh, quantities like the heat content and CO2 in the ocean. Uh, we looked at anthropogenic invasion of CO2, for example, and so on, right? So. Uh, surface to 700 meters, uh, you can see that there are patterns. There are certain regions in the North uh, Atlantic and the Tropical Atlantic which show much higher trend and there is a band here that is uh, uh, in the Southern Ocean uh, subtropical front with the Indian Ocean that shows uh, a band with uh, uh, the Kuroshio and the uh, Gulf Stream and the uh, deep water formation sites of the Labrador Sea and the Greenland, Iceland, Norwegian Sea show some trends. Uh, oftentimes there are dynamical reasons that are uh, associated with these uh, specific regions where trends are higher. Uh, for example, if we look at surface trends, which is somewhat obvious here, so here we are looking at zonally averaged uh, temperature trend with surfaces surface uh, showing higher trends than subsurface which is uh, expected but there are subtropical gyre region where heat is penetrating much deeper but remember that this is completely averaged over all longitudes and the deep water formation uh, site shows much deeper penetration of uh, heat uptake by the ocean so wherever water is sinking we said it is taking down heat with it along with uh, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and other uh, uh, gases in the atmosphere, and C14, and so on and so forth. So uh, the uh, Atlantic, of course, is uh, a key player. Uh, if you remember, uh, we talked about Atlantic meridional uh, overturning circulation as a part of the thermohaline circulation, where we have warm surface water crossing the equator, supplying the region where water is sinking, and that water is going south below the surface uh, into the Southern Ocean and inundating the Indian Ocean and so on. And there are connections between the Pacific and Indian Ocean over here. So all these things have to be uh, put together. The mean temperatures are shown here as well well, with warmer temperatures in the lower latitudes, subtropical gyres showing, uh, you know, convergence and deepening of the uh, uh, isotherms so, and the thermocline, and here is the sinking of uh, the uh, North Atlantic deep water that influences the zonal mean uh, as well. And here are the horizontally averaged surface temperature changes, uh, showing again width depth. Uh, What's the difference? This is uh, a section. Uh, this is zonally averaged trend, and this is horizontally averaged temperature changes. So these trends are in degree C per decade with the scale shown here. You might think, what's the big deal? These are such small numbers. But the problem is that 
uh, the amount of heat, the amount of energy with each centimeter of the ocean or each meter of the ocean warming by 0.1 degree C can be uh, huge. It can be compared to the total amount of energy that's produced and consumed by the entire planet, for example. So these are not small numbers here when we looked at petajoules before uh, and so on. So this is the difference between surface temperature and temperature at 200 degrees centigrade over this period of 1960 to 2010 and you can see that the uh, deeper ocean is uh, beginning to warm so the um, temperature difference is uh, increasing uh, which uh, means surface is warming and subsurface is still catching up as you can see here uh, this is now uh, this is a, a section m uh, of trend and this is change over time so just be sure you understand those things so this is the zonal mean trend and this is the evolution so in the 1960s to about the 80s there was not much warming near the surface or in the deeper ocean but as we got into the uh, 80s uh, and 90s and 2000s uh, the surface warming has accelerated and the penetration of heat deeper into the ocean has also accelerated with these warming rates of uh, degree C per uh, decade uh, so one has to be uh, uh, able to uh, appreciate the amount of energy that the ocean is taking up um, the thermohaline circulation directly affects the uh, ocean dynamics, atmosphere dynamics in general, uh, tend to affect the patterns of warming. We talked about polar amplification and land war warming versus ocean warming. We talked about the Gulf Stream region warming in the North Atlantic. And here is a warming hole that is uh, over this period 1990 to 2019 uh, is a minimum in warming or maybe even slightly negative. Uh, why does this happen? So if you now use our ideas or our understanding of the thermohaline circulation, remember the upper branch of the thermohaline circulation is bro bringing heat across the equator to this region where the water uh, is sinking. So uh, one of the ideas is that the thermohaline circulation is slowing down, so less heat is being brought uh, to this region and there are evidences uh, thermohaline circulation is easier to define but it's not very easy to measure it's an integrated measure so you need lots of observations to integrate and compute the transport uh, of mass and heat so often they are uh, uh, indirectly uh, estimated or uh, they're estimated with the so-called reanalysis products that we talked about where we take an ocean model, assimilate all the data into it and the ocean model of course computes the currents and the transports and temperatures so you can compute heat transports uh, and so on. So uh, that's one. There are other explanations associated with aerosols and volcanoes and so on but nonetheless the, st the best idea that seems to be uh, consistent with this lack of warming or even slight cooling is related to changes in the o uh, thermohaline circulation so you expect that uh, with warming and more rain maybe melting of glaciers from Greenland if you begin to put fresh water to the surface uh, in the region of deep water formation then it becomes harder to create denser water okay remember that salinity is much higher here than here and that's one of the reasons why you can form deep water here but if you put fresh water that's going to get weaker the other region that's always very uh, interesting and important is this eastern pacific region which also shows a slight uh, cooling or much less warming than over here for example this is in the range of let's say 0.5 to 0.8 degree centigrade per dec degree Fahrenheit per decade or so whereas here it is close to zero or maybe minus 0.1 to 2 uh, degree Fahrenheit per decade why does it matter because this is climatologically the cold place around Galapagos with uh, upwelling and uh, temperatures on the annual mean of 20 to 23 degrees centigrade whereas here it is more in the range of 28 to 29 degrees centigrade and remember where there are cold temperatures there are high pressures where there are warm temperatures there are low pressures near the equator the the uh, Coriolis is weak so pressure gradient from the east to west can drive winds 
So whether this region warms uh, slower or faster than the west will determine whether that sea surface temperature gradient and surface pressure gradient will get stronger in the sense of the trend or get weaker. If it gets stronger, then the winds that go from high pressure to low pressure are upwelling favorable, which means they diverge water away from the equator and can reinforce the cooling in the trend and hence the pressure gradient, which means ocean can continue to take up heat. This is the region where dynamically water is being brought up and it's being warmed as it being moved north. So ocean is soaking up heat. This is one of the main regions where ocean is soaking up heat. So as long as this remains cooler uh, than this in the trend and or warms less than here, the ocean heat uptake will continue. If this warms more or uh, the same as here, the gradient can get flatter and the ocean's ability to take continue to take up heat in the deep tropics will uh, weaken. Okay, Those are the things we have to remember. So we are now combining our uh, ocean dynamics with uh, global warming. So just be careful that you are following the arguments. The thing also continues with salinity. So these are the mean salinities. As we said, salinity here is much higher than here. You can see this is in the range of uh, 35 in the subtropical gyre uh, and 36 or so here. This is 37 and above. 37 and above here it is in the range of 35 or so. Here it's in the range of 33. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we have deep water formation uh, here. Uh, and there are contrasts with high fresh water forcing from rivers and rains, evaporative regions have much higher salinities. These are the evaporative regions as well. Uh, the Southern Ocean is different again. And if we look at the salinity changes, this is the uh, salinity change from uh, 1950 to 2008 in grams per kilogram. So it's gotten fresher here, somewhat more saline here. Atlantic has a complex pattern with the ITCZ region showing a freshening, but the subtropical gyres showing a uh, 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 increasing salinities uh, uh, that are important because um, and here as well. So this should be consistent with changes in evaporation, precipitation, Atlantic meridional overturning circulation and so on. So this is how we uh, work by combining multiple evidences to say how global warming is affecting um, surface uh, ocean, subsurface ocean, heat uptake uh, and precipitation changes. So salinity can act as an indicator of changes in the hydrologic cycle. Clearly increased rainfall would increase uh, salinity. Uh, decreased rainfall and increased evaporation would increase salinity uh, and so on. So these are the uh, kind of rain gauges or hydrological cycle metrics of uh, the ocean. So I'm just going through this so that you can appreciate the uh, interactions between the ocean and the atmosphere as climate science. Uh, we'll look at one good example in the next podcast of El Nino and how atmosphere response and ocean response to global warming and how the, the system uh, is uh, recording the changes uh, in heat content, heat penetration, salinity changes, precipitation changes, hydrological changes, uh, and when we look at impact it will become much more clear about the other evidences uh, that we look at to understand uh, global changes. Um, okay. <laughs>